Um, hello, everybody. I'm Leslie Aiello, and I'm talking to you today from Brooklyn, New York. It's a shame that we can't be together for this year's Osmond Hill lecture and for the PSGB meeting. It would have been lovely to reconnect with all of my old PSGB friends and to see what's happening with the Modern Association. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to receive the award this year. The reason is, is that it had been given to my uh, PhD advisor, who was the first Osmond Hill uh, awardee in 1978. Uh, he was Michael Day, and his lecture was on human evolution, fossils, and concepts. For th those of you who didn't know Michael, uh, he was president of PSGB from 1976 to 1979, and uh, he was at that point one of the world's leading authorities on the evolution of the hominid postcrania. And you see him here with uh, pictures of his analysis of the Lytoli footprints, uh, where he de de demonstrated that they had a human-like uh, bipedal gait. Now, uh, today, what I want to talk to you about is the expensive tissue hypothesis. And it's now been 25 years since Peter Wheeler and I developed the hypothesis. Uh, it was published in Current Anthropology in 1995. And what I want to do today is talk about what the expensive tissue hypothesis is and how it was developed what's happened to it over the past 25 years, and how these changes have affected our interpretation of the evolution of humans and the human brain. Now, if we go back 25 years, the general pattern of human evolution wasn't much different than it is now. Although things have been highly complicated through the discovery of new fossils and more information about the species that we didn't know about at that time. Now, one important thing for the expensive tissue hypothesis is that 25 years ago, we knew very little about the postcranial evolution of the hominids. We have the Lucy skeleton that was discovered in the 1970s and the Narakotomi boy that was discovered in the 1980s. And what we naively thought at that time is that you basically had two postcranial patterns among the hominids. You had the Australopithecine pattern like Lucy that had very wide thorax, wide hips, short, short legs, long arms. Uh, this uh, contrasted with Homo erectus that had a very modern human-like body form, narrow trunk, uh, long legs and relatively shorter arms. Now, one of the most important things about the discovery of Lucy was that it broke the earlier dogma that argued that the evolution of the brain was a feedback system. So if you were bipedal, this freed your hands for the use of tools. If you were using tools, you needed greater intelligence. And the tool use and brain size uh, feedback system was really the main hypothesis that was used to explain the evolution of the brain. Now, of course, with the discovery of Lucy, uh, we re re realized that uh, the evolution of bipedal locomotion uh, happened considerably before any change in the evolution of the brain size. So here you, you, you can see Lu Lucy around uh, three million years ago, plus or minus. You don't have the increase in brain size until you come up to between two and 1.5 million years ago. Now, what this did was really kickstart an interest in what could be causing this radical evolution of brain size we see in the hominid lineage. Now, at that time, there were basically two main groups of hypotheses to explain the evolution of brain size. You had an uh, the ecologically oriented hypothesis, and perhaps the most well-known is the extractive foraging hypothesis, where intelligence would be needed for the hominids to live in a particular environment. 
The second group of hypotheses were social brain hypotheses. And of course, the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis and uh, Robin Dunbar's well-known social brain hypothesis. Now, all of these were explaining why or how, or primarily why the brain expanded. Uh, with Peter Wheeler, we took a different approach and we wanted to explain how the brain was able to evolve, not the selective pressures that might have caused or been involved in the evolution of that brain size. Now, what we were very impressed by was the Kleiber relationship of body size to basal met metabolic rate that showed that humans were really almost on the line that would be expected for a animal of our body size. And when you contrast this to the uh, allometry of body weight versus brain weight, you can see that uh, humans have a much larger brain size than would be expected. Now, what the mystery was, was where humans got the energy to support that extremely expensive large brain size. Now, uh, the expensive tissue hypothesis posits that you have a direct trade-off between the size of your gut or digestive system and the size of the brain. This chart shows uh, what the brain size and uh, gut size would be in a primate of our body size, contrasted to what we have, what we see in modern humans. So you, you have almost the perfect uh, payoff. And it turns out, of course, that guts are very expensive and energetically, as is brain size. Now, uh, what we uh, argued at the time was that in order to achieve a small gut, you needed to have a very high quality, easy to digest diet. And we suggested that that dietary change involved the increased incorporation of animal-based products in the diet. Now, I, in, the, in the paper, the expensive tissue hypothesis is basically a high quality diet. Uh, you have your reduced bulk, more rapid assimilation, resulting in a smaller gut. The energy is available uh, to support a larger brain. But we also argue that a higher quality diet could directly provide energy available to the brain. And then uh, in terms of why the brain may have evolved, the more complex foraging behavior feeded into the, uh, the evolution of the larger brain. Now, as ma ma many hypotheses, uh, this uh, general idea was in the air. And particularly Bill Leonard had two papers that were published at the time, one in 1992, one in 1994 arguing the importance of the high quality diet to the larger brain size. The unique factor of the, hum of the expensive tissue hypothesis is uh, this uh, route through the smaller gut, making the increased energy available. It's also interesting that neither, P neither Peter Wheel or I knew of Bill Leonard's work at the time. And of course, the, the, this was before online searches were uh, readily available to academics. Now, uh, what we tried to do is find ways of testing this hypothesis and to argue when this actually happened in human evolution. And here we come back to the postcranial skeletons that we have. And what we argued was that the small narrow thorax would leave relatively little room for the expansive ape-like gut. And therefore the evolution of the smaller gut must have happened uh, between the time the yo know, changed from the Australopithecine like body form that was thought at the time to be characteristic of um, all of the Australopithecines and maybe even Homo habilis. So uh, the small digestive system would have evolved somewhere in this period between two and 1.5 million years ago and be documented by the Narikotomi skeleton.
Now, uh, also, we knew that there were stone tools and increased evidence of uh, hominid exploitation of animal-based sources at this time period. And of course, to, to today, we know that we have some stone tools e even earlier down in uh, the period older than 3 million years ago. But uh, what seemed to be happening is that you had a development of the reliance of animal-based food. And by the time you arrive at Homo erectus, uh, you had the system of the small gut, the re relatively larger brain size. Now, uh, of course, there is further evidence that's come up over the years, and particularly the Bramble and Lieberman endurance running hypothesis which argued that many features of the skeleton actually showed evidence of adaptation to endurance running uh, that would have been useful in hunting behavior. Now, it, it wasn't only hominids that we uh, applied this to. Uh, we, we also thought that the hypothesis might gain more strength <clears throat> if it had a more general applicability. And we uh, analyzed the then available primate uh, brain size and gut mass data. And there was a nice negative relationship between primates with large brain size so that also had smaller guts <clears throat> and uh, those with large brain sizes that had larger guts. Now, uh, th th this was substantiated on our original data set by Eisler and Van Schaik in 2006, uh, using both residual analysis and also, um, <clears throat> and also independent contrast. Now, uh, this whole conclusion that it's, uh, the hypothesis has a more general applicability has probably been the one area that it's been most heavily criticized. Uh, before we sort of go on to look at, uh, at those criticisms and to see how the whole idea is de de developed, there are a few fun facts about the expensive tissue hypothesis. The first being is that uh, it was pointed out by Darwin in The Origin of the Species that uh, at least among domesticated species, you had an increased investment in one trait uh, that would tend to reduce the investment in other traits. Uh, a few, few decades later, Sir Arthur Keith uh, also pointed out that there was a reverse, an inverse relationship between brain size and stomach size in primates. And in 1950, he actually lamented the fact that the findings in this obscure paper of his uh, went entirely unsighted. Now, the next fun fact is that neither Peter Wheeler or I coined the term the expensive tissue hypothesis. It was coined by Alan Walker, who, when I gave one of the first presentations of the hypothesis, and I believe this was in 1993 at the Paleo <clears throat> Anthropology Society, Society meetings, he came up to me afterwards and said, that idea needs a name. Why don't you call it the expensive tissue hypothesis? Now, uh, another fun fact is that my involvement with energetics and with the expensive tissue hypothesis was entirely fortuitous. Um, in the, um, I, uh, what one of my colleagues at University College London was Bob Martin, and he, together with Steve Jones and David Pilbeam, were editing the Cambridge Encyclopedia on Human Evolution, and they wanted somebody to do the entry on the energetics, and I think Bob um, chose me uh, because my interest at the time was in postcranial evolution. And much of the primate energetic work at the time had to do with locomotor energetics. Uh, my uh, PhD thesis had been on the allometry of size and shape in human evolution. And of course, my true love was uh, comparative evolutionary anatomy. But through writing that paper, or, excuse, or writing the entry to the encyclopedia, uh, I realized that there was this problem with the BMR 
the basal metabolic rate and the increased uh, grain size. And the, the, this led to my collaboration with Peter Wheeler and the development of the hypothesis. Now, the last thing I wanted to mention was current anthropology, because at that time, uh, what I wanted was the hypothesis to reach a broader anthropological audience. But we had a horrible time getting the hypothesis published. Uh, the editor of current anthropology at that time was a social anthropologist who thought the idea was too scientific for an anthropological audience and would, um, and would be of no interest whatsoever. Uh, I got a little bit of revenge on this, in fact, in two ways, uh, because the expensive tissue hypothesis paper uh, was the most highly cited paper in current anthropology for many years. And also when I moved to the States to take over the Wintergren Foundation, I actually uh, was in the position of, <clears throat> of owning current anthropology because of course current anthropology uh, was um, developed and has been run by the Wintergren Foundation since its inception. Now, uh, what's interesting about it is that's the citations because I, to date it's been cited about uh, 2,500 times. And this is according to Google Scholar. But for the first decade or so, it was minimally cited. And in the last 10 or 15 years, it's averaged about 150 citations a year. But the great majority of these are critical of the hypothesis and pointing out its problems. Now, what's happened to it over the past 25 years? Uh, the great majority of the discussion about the expensive tissue hypothesis has involved other groups of animals, bats, birds, more work on primates, and also even fish and amphibians. Uh, the first main um, test of the expensive tissue hypothesis was by Kate Jones and Anne McLarnon where they looked at 300 species of bats. And what they uh, discovered is rather than being a negative relationship between brain size and gut size in bats, there was a positive relationship. And what they uh, did was uh, also note that none of the other major hypotheses for brain size at the time were uh, supported in the bats, in particular the maternal energy hypothesis that was put forward by Bob Martin. And th this hypothesis suggested that an offspring's brain size was dependent on the maternal energetic status. Uh, so uh, th th this was uh, a little bit of a blow, but what, what one of the facts about uh, this analysis is that it relied on intestinal length rather than mass. And in primates, uh, intestinal length uh, also doesn't have an inverse relationship with um, body size. Now, what, what one very interesting thing is in a subsequent paper that was published by Kate Jones and some of her colleagues, uh, they saw a very significant uh, relationship with brain size, but uh, not, not, not involving gut size. This involved testy size in bats. Now, uh, I didn't know that uh, bats had a tremendous variation in testy size. And those bat species that have promiscuous females uh, tend to be the species where the males, uh, well, in fact, both males and females, but it, 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 in the males, you have a uh, relatively small brain size that is traded off by the testy size. And in fact, in some bat species, the testy size can be twice the percentage of body weight as uh, the brain size is. So the, what, what this demonstrated is that you can have an organ trade-off with brain size. It doesn't necessarily have to be gut size. It depends on the species. Now, one uh, interesting thing about this is that uh, the explanation that was suggested 
was that this trade-off uh, occurred because of the very high metabolic cost of bat flight. And uh, this in the current context of the pandemic where people have looked at why bats can harbor uh, the viruses. I, it looks like one reason is, is again, because of their very high me metabolic costs in transportation. And they've evolved ways of reducing inflammation. And uh, these uh, have also allowed them to harbor the viruses, which wouldn't be sustainable in ma many other species. So you do have a trade-off here between organ and brain size. Now, the next ma major now, the next ma major test was in birds. And this came from uh, Karen Isler and Carl von Schaik. And what they noticed that there was no trade-off between, again, intestinal length and brain mass. But where you had your trade-off was between brain size and pectoral muscle mass. And of course, this would be a proxy for the cost of flight. So uh, those that had a higher cost of flight, the proxy being the largest pectoral muscle mass, also had a um, smaller brain size. Now, uh, they went on to develop what was known as the expensive brain hypothesis. And this is a, a very logical analysis of the situation where they uh, have um, the trade-offs and pain for a large uh, brain can inv uh, involve both allocation and the energy turnover. Again, what Peter and I had said in the original paper, but they mapped it out. So you have maintenance where you can have a reduction in brain size, you can have a reduction in muscle mass, again, uh, being a proxy for locomotor costs. You can have a reduction in production. So you can have changes to growth, changes to re reproduction in other mammals, litter size, and also birth interval. Now, one of my favorite examples of this has to do with human growth and development. And this was published by Chris Kuzawa in 2014. And what he shows in both in uh, males and females, that the energy put into the growth of the infant brain uh, directly is um, contrasted to a reduction in the energy put into growth. And so this could be one very significant exp explanation for why humans have a much slower growth than other smaller brained animals. Now, uh, what, what one of the uh, very interesting re re revolutive things that has come out of Isler von Schack's work is the gray ceiling hypothesis because what this argues is at the, as the brain becomes larger and larger across the primates, you reach a point where the costs of reproduction uh, and the consequences, I should say also, become so great that you can't sustain your population. Now, what uh, this is based on is the fact, for example, that as your brain mass increases, your gestation length increases. Uh, as brain mass increases, your lactation period increases. As brain mass increases, uh, the time to sexual maturity increases. Now you notice here that humans, which are the black dots, have bucked the trend in some of these instances. Uh, here with neocortex, or the, excuse me, neonatal mass, uh, humans have a much smaller mass of their babies, their neonates, than would be expected by the general allometric trend. Uh, the same thing is true in length of the period of lactation. And in here in our fertility, uh, humans have bucked the trend in being much more fertile than you would expect according to the primate trend. Now, what is 
fascinating about this is that their gray ceiling here comes at about 655 cubic centimeters. And this is exactly in this area of the transition between the Australopithecines in through the early Homo to the Homo legaster. So it would fall approximately in this region. And what this is saying is that the hominids actually reached a crisis at this time period and something had to change if they were going to uh, uh, continue to benefit uh, from having a larger brain size. Now, what the explanation for was allo uh, care of the offspring. And perhaps what, what one of the most uh, well-known hypotheses in this area is the grandmother hypothesis that was put forward by Kristen Hawkes and her colleagues where uh, she argues that uh, grandmothers can be quite productive. And here we see the uh, calories per day that uh, Hatsa women can gather uh, according to their age. And what they're uh, arguing is that this uh, in increase in resources uh, from other members of the society were able to alleviate the energetic strains of reproduction on the fertile females. And of course, for those of you who are familiar with the grandmother hypothesis, uh, they also argue that this was involved in the uh, development of menopause uh, in the human mind. Now, uh, one of the uh, more recent contributions of the <clears throat> Gisler and Benchik um, uh, team has been uh, the work by N N Navaretta, uh, arguing that there is a brain fat trade off in a uh, hundred mammalian species. Now, uh, th 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 this is actually a fantastic data set. And Navaretta spent a tremendous amount of time gathering the data during the dissections to get a really accurate understanding of uh, brain size, organ size, subconaceous fat uh, across all of these animal species. And the take home message of this is that there is a negative uh, relationship in most animals between adipose tissue and brain mass. So the larger the brain size you have, the less adipose tissue and vice versa. Now, what their uh, uh, argument is, is that both of these are insurance policies for survival, that the brain size and greater intelligence would aid your survival, as would a um, increase in adipose tissue that could carry you over crisis periods um, in your life. Now, uh, what their argument is, is that humans have the best of both worlds. And the reason that they can maintain this is that they have a much lower <clears throat> lo lo locomotor costs. Uh, and here, bipedal humans um, have a much lower cost of transport than either quad quadrupedal or bipedal chimpanzees. Um, what's uh, sort of curious about this analysis is that it doesn't work with primates. And this may be due to either the small sample size they had uh, for primates, or uh, it may be an actual function of uh, primates and the type of primate uh, lo 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 locomotion and adaptation. That this is something that we just don't know now. Now, uh, the uh, hypothesis uh, actually does work in some species. Uh, in mammals, it seems to be relatively rare. There's other organ trade-offs and other types of energetic trade-offs that are used to support large brain size. But where it does work is in fish. And uh, th this uh, first began to appear quite early on. And in, in a very nice analysis that, done by uh, Kaufman, who was a student at the time, 
And what he saw is in one species of tropical fish that you did have a direct trade-off between brain size and gut size in relation to uh, comparator species. And th th this was rather funny because uh, Jason Kaufman gave this as a poster at one of the AAPA meetings. And I walked up to him and I had my badge turned around so he didn't know who I was. And he was actually trashing the expensive tissue hypothesis to uh, another uh, young man who was um, lo looking at the poster saying how silly he thought it was and it would never work and how astounded he was to find that it actually worked in fish. And when he re realized that who I was standing there, he became extremely embarrassed. And uh, it, 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 it was actually funny and we uh, in the end of the meetings being quite good friends. But um, the bottom line is that it does seem to work in fish and more recent analysis has shown that it seems to be a rule in fish rather than the exception. Uh, there's quite a nice paper uh, done on like Tanganyika cichlids. And very importantly, there was a paper done on guppies. Now, the reason the guppy um, paper is very important uh, is that uh, it uh, is a, a, an actual test rather than a correlation analysis. Um, what uh, the guppy work uh, did is they actually bred for large brain guppies. And in uh, their test species, uh, they uh, found that those large brain guppies they bred for also had uh, small uh, intestines. So here in the shark, you have uh, female gut mass, male gut mass, small brain females have larger guts, uh, large brain, smaller guts. And uh, the relationship is even more extreme in the male guppies. So it, it does seem to, to, to work in fish and it also works in amphibians. So there has, there's something here with the cold bloodedness. And uh, this may be similar to the, bat, uh, to the bat testes, that when you're under energetic stress, and of course with cold blooded animals having a much lower metabolic rate, uh, the trade-off between brain size and gut size may be one of the most efficient ways of paying for that large brain size. Now, how has this affected our interpretation of the evolution of humans and the human brain? Uh, from what we've been talking about, we have cooperation is important, change in growth, growth and development. We have uh, reduced uh, cost of, of locomotion. Uh, we have fat stores in humans. And of course, no one has contradicted the fact that humans do have a relatively small gut size for a brain size that is related to some type of a significant dietary change. Now, the, there's been relatively little work done on what this dietary change may have been, except of course for Richard Wrangham's famous cooking hypothesis. And he's one of the only ones who's taken on what that change of diet producing the small gut size could have been. Now, uh, he, he, he argues that modern humans can't rely on raw food. So the uh, increased percentage of raw food in, in the diet uh, results in a decline of your body mass index and in an increase in amenorrhea in females. And his argument is that raw food is not sustainable for humans, whether or not it's meat or tubers or any other type of uh, vegetable food. Now, the, the problem with this is the record of fire uh, or the archeological record of fire. So we do have some indication there may have been hominid use of fire at Kobe 4 uh, about 1.6 million years ago, but the record is very sparse up until the last um, 
million years or so. So here we have around 8,000 years in South Africa, one underwear cave. And then uh, we don't get fire um, commonly found in archeological sites until the last 400,000 years ago. So if we look at, again, the chart of brain size uh, increase, uh, you have minimal fire reliance up through to more recent times where we see another spurt in the increase of in brain size. What's going on in this time period, we really don't know and it's one of the current mysteries in human evolution. Uh, there, of course, could be a variety of different type of diets, particularly aquatic resources, small uh, animals, we really don't know. And uh, there has uh, also been some research uh, by Rachel Carmody and her group uh, showing uh, in mice, this is, that cooked food here with the CW is cooked raw, cooked process and being pounded um, is much more uh, significant in terms of making resources available to, to the body than um, having it raw, whether it's um, raw food <clears throat> uh, that's uh, not prepared or raw food that's pounded. So I, th th this whole area in terms of diet is a huge mystery in human evolution. And of course, the, 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 this is the time period that the hominids expanded uh, out of Africa and were able to colonize a variety of different environments. So uh, I'd like to see much more work in diet uh, in this time period of Homo agaster, Homo erectus, uh, leading up to, of course, Neanderthals and modern humans. Now, uh, I'd, I'd like to finish with one last analysis that I think is tremendously important. And this is the constrained total energy uh, uh, expenditure model that's been put forward by Herman Ponser and his colleagues. And the reason that this is so important is that it looks at the energy turnover part of the equation uh, rather than the allocation part of the equation. And what made this possible was his use of doubly labeled water that allows uh, to, uh, well, basically it's a very efficient way of determining what the actual total energy expenditure is. And uh, to make a long story and quite elegant story short, what he's uh, determined is that each species has an involved total energy expenditure and humans have a higher total en energy expenditure than other hominoid primates. So here we have the humans, we have chimps, gorillas, and pongo. And this relationship between homo and pan, the increase in the total energy expenditure is enough to support the large brain and enough to support increased reproductive costs. So there actually has been an evolution in the total energy expenditure uh, that we weren't aware of prior. Now he's gone back and uh, analyzed some of the BMR work as well, and has uh, noticed that we do have an increase in BMR as well as total energy expenditure in humans. Now, what this has done is basically turn the old Kleiber equation of body weight to metabolic rate uh, and, re and caused us to, to rethink this. Uh, and what we've appreciated now is this here in this point of humans being on the Kleiber line isn't anything other than that we've evolved up to that point. And as part of um, Ponser's hypothesis, uh, he argues that the primates uh, began with a very low metabolic rate. And this, in fact, may explain why Shrekshurines have a much smaller brain size for their body size, uh, where their brain size is uh, in line with uh, their metabolic rate. 
So um, this is a very important hypothesis for allowing us to rethink uh, what um, we what, what the energetic factors in human evolution was. We have trade-offs, but we also have an evolution in the increase in our total uh, energy budget. So uh, to, 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 to finish, in the line leading up to Homo erectus, uh, we have uh, the period where as the brain expanded, there were a number of accommodations that had to be made evolutionarily speaking. Uh, it, all of the trade-offs we talked about, the uh, evolution in the total energy expenditure, dietary change, and there's still much we don't know about this. But uh, it's one of the most fascinating parts of human evolution. And I'm only happy that the expensive tissue hypothesis has played a part in our understanding of what may have been going on at this time. There is much more research that needs to, to, to be done. And all that we really know are some of the pieces that need to be put into this puzzle. But what's sure is that Homo erectus that came out the uh, uh, other end uh, was able to survive for an extremely long period of time. Uh, the other fascinating area is up here at the top and what uh, actually was involved in the move from this relatively stable uh, evolutionary period into the evolution of the uh, Denisovans, Neanderthals, and Homo. So uh, I'd like to thank you very, very much uh, and thank all of my colleagues who've helped uh, me de de to develop uh, this, uh, the expensive tissue hypothesis. Of course, P P Peter Wheeler, who was my collaborator throughout. Uh, and particularly, I'd like to call out D D David Shivers, who um, uh, was the source of the gut information many interesting talks with Robin Dunbar, who had been a colleague at U U UCL, as well as all of the input from all of my friends and colleagues from UCL and the Natural History Museum. And again, a special thanks to the Primate Society for awarding me the Osmond Hill uh, Memorial Medal for 2020. Thank you very much.